Who do you think is the worst team in NFL history? The 0-16 2017 Browns? Maybe the first 0-16, the 2008 Lions? Maybe you're old school and think that it was the 1976 0-14 Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But me? I don't think it's any of them. I think it's the Cincinnati Reds. <laughs> Now before I get into why the Reds were so terrible, I want to cover why the other teams were slightly less terrible. While the Buccaneers, Browns, and Lions all were unable to win a game, they were miles better than the Reds ever were. Here's a few things that those three teams accomplished that the Reds could not. They had at least one game where they held the score within one possession at the end. They scored more than one touchdown the entire season. And they finished the season. The Reds were unable to do any of these things. The 1934 Cincinnati Reds, the football team, not the baseball team, were really terrible. Like, unbelievably so. Like, the worst team in league history, and I'm going to tell you why. Before we can talk about the atrocity that is 1934, we need to briefly talk about 1933, the inaugural season in the NFL for the Reds. They were bad even by expansion team standards. They started off the season with four straight losses followed up by a 0-0 tie, followed up by another loss against the Philadelphia Eagles. This was especially bad considering that only 450 people were in attendance for this game at a National Football League game. Imagine that happening today. Beyond this, the team decided to make a coaching change after this loss to the Eagles, and things surprisingly took a turn in the right direction. Mike Palm took over as the head coach, and the Reds won three out of four games to end the season. Despite these wins, the Reds had what would be an NFL all-time low of 38 points total across their 10-game season. Oh, how good they had it and did not realize heading into 1934. The 1934 season actually seemed to start off with some promise for the Reds, as they played in their home stadium in front of over 14,000 fans. This was four times as many fans as they played in front of in their season closer the previous season. Some of this had to do with the fact that the other Reds, the baseball team, had actually had a pretty poor showing, and the Reds themselves, the football team, had the market all to themselves. They lost the season opener against the Pittsburgh Pirates, another NFL team with a baseball expansion name, 13-0. But it's alright. You're not going to win every game, the opener can always be kind of difficult, so let's move on past that. In their next game, they went to Chicago to play against the Cardinals in front of 6,000 fans, a little bit lower, but it's alright. Again, it's always hard to hold up numbers. This was a game they would lose 10-0. This was the final game played in Triangle Park Stadium. The next week, the Reds played back in their home stadium, Crossley Field, against the defending champion Chicago Bears. It went about as well as you might expect, but the Reds did score the first points of the season and lost to the Bears 21-3. This was the final professional game played at Crossley Field. So we're going to pause for a moment here. Three games into the season, the Reds have scored three points and already killed two stadiums. This is not going very well. After being kicked out of their home stadium, Crossley Field, the Reds played their next home game at Xavier University's Corcoran Stadium. The stadium had a capacity of 15,000, but the Reds were only able to fill one-sixth of it in a rematch against the Cardinals. They lost 16-0. This gave the Cardinals first place in the Western Division. The Reds would never play in Cincinnati again. The Packers were able to routinely draw 11,000 fans when they were in Lambeau. However, only 3,000 people showed up to watch Green Bay thoroughly destroy the Reds. The Packers kicker, running back, and defensive back Hank Brudger scored three touchdowns, intercepted three passes, and kicked four extra points as Green Bay punished the Reds 41-0. Brudger scored over twice as many points in this one game as Cincinnati would score the entire season. This one guy. The whole season. The next week, the undefeated Chicago Bears played host to the Reds at Wrigley Field. Yes, the baseball stadium. This game began as it, well, as it should. The Bears scored three touchdowns, and then something in the second quarter very strange happened. The Reds began to move the ball a little bit, and they didn't stop, and it kept going and going until Sil Salmer, from 11 yards out, ran over the goal line for a touchdown. Hillary Lee kicked the extra point, and the Reds had scored their only touchdown of the season. This is such an interesting part of what was already a fairly interesting story. The Bears were the defending champions, and they were undefeated this season and the Reds had scored every point they would this season against the Bears. The touchdown is even more jarring. To this point, they had yet to get to the red zone all season, and they were able to score a touchdown. 
This is absolute insanity. Any given Sunday didn't really apply as far as winning for the Reds, but I guess it did as far as making it to the end zone. <laughs> The Bears, however, punished them for this transgression of scoring on them and scored three more touchdowns to send them to 0-6. This was not ideal for the Reds or for the young NFL that probably didn't want to have a team out there outright embarrassing them. With no home and little talent, the Reds were quickly becoming a burden on the NFL. They tried to fix this by finding them a new home. They started with Portsmouth. Portsmouth had previously housed an NFL team, the Spartans. They moved to Detroit and became the Lions. As luck would have it, the Lions were the team playing off against the Reds in the return to Portsmouth. This game, unfortunately, went the opposite of how the NFL would want it to go, as the Portsmouth fans went wild for the Lions, who sent the Reds down to 0-7. Joe Carr, the league president, had a grim future for the Reds after this, as he said, quote, Something will be done within another week, as all teams playing them are losing plenty of money. End quote. The next Saturday, the announcement came. The Reds would play their final game of the season against the Philadelphia Eagles. That Monday, the team would be gone. The Eagles were 1-5 heading into the stadium, so maybe it would be less terrible than any other game. The Eagles beat them 64-0. It is the second largest blowout in the history of the NFL. At that point, the Reds ceased to exist. They were 3-14-1 lifetime, scoring 48 points and getting outscored by 350. In 1934, they threw more interceptions than they scored points. They threw more pick sixes than touchdowns. And that was the 1934 Cincinnati Reds. They hold some fairly dubious honors in the history of the NFL. Their 10 points on the season, obviously, is the worst in NFL history. On defense, they gave up 6.4 yards per carry. In the history of the NFL, no other team has given up more than 5. The St. Louis Gunners, an independent football team, played the final three games of their schedule. In the first game, they beat Pittsburgh 6-0. St. Louis would finish ahead of Cincinnati in the final standings. So if ever you feel bad about how your team's doing in the season or anything like that, just remember, they will score touchdowns and they will finish the season. In the NFL, at least back in 1934, that wasn't guaranteed.